I just was like, just started to devour. I was fanatical about trying to find things I could do on my own so I could get better since he had only the one class a week. What's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 622, with my guest today, Mr. Steve Grogan. I am, of course, Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. Doesn't matter what you train, doesn't matter how long you've been trained, doesn't matter where you are. The things that we do are in respect, in support of you and your pursuits to become a better martial artist. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of different things. And the easiest way to figure all of it out is to go to whistlekick.com because we do a bunch of stuff. And if you go there, you're going to see all the different things that we've got going on. One of those things is our store. Yes, we sell some stuff. It's one of the ways we pay the bills. And if you use the code PODCAST15, it's going to save you 15% on all the things available for sale. This show, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes each and every week. And the entire purpose behind everything we do with the show, well, we're working hard to connect, educate, and entertain you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to help the show, the company, all the things that we're doing for you, you've got a bunch of ways you can help. I'm going to give you three. You can buy something. I already told you about that. You could tell a friend about what we're doing because word of mouth is still the best way for us to grow. It's the way that people are finding the show primarily. And then number three, we have a Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. What do you get when you support us on Patreon? Well, for as little as two bucks a month, you get access to exclusive content. And the more you're willing to contribute, the more content we give you. And we even throw you some free merch. So check out our Patreon page, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick and see all the things going on over there. Today's guest is a fellow content creator. He's got a book. He's got a bunch of stuff going over at YouTube, and we had an awesome conversation. We talked about martial arts. We talked about his experience in Wing Chun, his journey to get where he is today, and all the things that he thinks about with martial arts and how it impacts life, not just in general, but life overall. And maybe that sounds really vague, but at the same time, I can't think of a better way to encapsulate the varied conversation we just had. So let's have it. Here you go. Hey, Steve, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for being here. Thanks. You know, we're going to, we're going to talk about some stuff. Now we talk about a lot of different things on this show. We talk about the people, we talk about places, we talk about, well, my, my brain won't let me not say things, people, places, things. We talk about martial arts in so many different angles. And there was something when I was looking at at your, your materials that you sent over and, and listeners, you know, if you don't know, if you've never been on the show, you don't know how we do these things. But one of the things that we ask all of our guests, send over some pictures, send them, send over, you know, some, we, we have a form that we ask people to fill out. And, you know, one of the things in the question about title, you know, listeners heard me just refer to you by your first name. We don't always do that. And you were, you were pretty emphatic in, in the way that you, you answered that. So that, that's actually where I want to start. And we don't usually start here. You are providing resources to people. You are offering your knowledge to people mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that I, I don't think a lot of people are. So I'm going to ask a really specific aspect of this, and we'll use this to spider off and we'll talk about it. Why did you want to start essentially teaching martial arts? Well, because it it meant a lot to me growing up. Like I took mm. to it in a way where not a lot of people do. There are a handful of reasons why people take martial arts. Maybe they're they're like a teen, young teen, and maybe they get picked on at school. Maybe they say, "Mom, Dad, I want to defend myself if these bullies get physical." <laughs> you know, so the yeah. self defense. Or there's uh you know, there could be women who live in a, a super duper urban area. They don't want to, they, they want to defend themselves if some guy comes out of uh, the parking garage and, you know, tries to do some heinous things. Uh, people who do it because they just, on a whim, because they are sitting around watching History Channel on Friday night. I'd rather do something else. 
So they just say, oh, it was martial arts. I'll try that. It's more like a hobby kind of a thing. Uh, then there are pe people who really do want to do uh, tournaments and stuff, not just MMA. But, you know, I mean, Taekwondo and Karate and Judo and all those, they had, they had tournaments long before MMA came along. So that's been a thing a while too. But then there's the very, very rare... <laughs> And I don't mean to be blowing my own horn like I'm such a, <laughs> I'm such a unique individual because I'm not the only one who's done this. I think to a certain extent, anyone who decides to teach it has had this reason, which is uh, it gets inside your your head and your your spirit or your soul, whatever you want to call it, and your heart, and it changes it changes you or it awakens you to something about yourself and uh, for the better. And, uh, like I said, I think that probably gets in inside everyone who is teaching now, because I mean, it really takes something to go from someone who just wants to practice it to someone who then wants to teach it. And you're putting your own training by the wayside, you know, cause I mean, yeah. I mean, even though they say when you teach it, you can get better by teaching it because someone might, I think what they mean by that is someone might ask a question that makes you look at something in a way you didn't before. Um, so they say, you know, when you teach it, that helps you get better, but you got to figure there's a, there's a, there's a, a ceiling to that, you know, cause whether you're finding out new things or not, I mean, you're still training when you're training beginners, you know what I mean? You don't have anyone there to challenge, challenge you yet. You know, <laughs> like sure. someone has to stick with it long enough to get within your ballpark you know, within the vicinity of your skill level. And then it's like, oh, okay, now they're, now they're giving me a run for my money, you know, but uh, I, I, it meant a lot to me and my life. And I took to it more like um, an art form. Uh, and I, I'm the tie of the type of mindset where I, I don't know when I want, when I see something or encounter something where I'm like, oh, I want to, I'd like to do that and get good at that. I uh, I go all in, you know. I put all yeah. my chip, I push all my chips forward, and I really <laughs> go after it till I I get it. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing because you can ignore other things. And you know, like in my current training with my current Tifu, I started a new Wing Chun lineage, which obviously you know we'll get to the history and stuff when you're ready. But uh, in the new lineage, I do the my Sifu, his name's uh, Larry London. He teaches a rather lesser known Wing Chun lineage, which is descends from a gentleman named Lung Sheng. And again, we can get more into that, what that yeah. means later. But they, this lineage has a specific focus on, on something called rooting and, you know, sinking your roots, sinking your roots into the, into the ground and, mm -hmm drawing your power up from the ground and really being able to hit super hard in a short distance. And also even being able to not be moved by anyone unless, unless you want to move, mm. you know? And, yeah. and he said to me, you know, you go home and you do this uh, and you could even have your fiance help you train, like just get in your stance and put your, uh, put your monsao out, which is a Wing Chun technique it means asking hand he's like extend your asking hand and have her push on your arm push into you and just sink her pressure into your roots and she won't be able to move you unless you want to be moved and my my fiance has had zero martial arts experience not nothing not even wing chun and yet she's pushing me around and i'm like oh my god I, i've been doing wing chun since 95 i feel like a beginner again <laughs> Because here's someone who had no martial arts experience and she's able to get me out of my stance. And I'm just like obsessively, you know, like every night I'm like, oh, come on, Jen, come here and push on my thing. You know, I'm trying to push on me. I, I need to know I'm getting somewhere, you know. What's her response to that? I, I, I bet a lot of the listeners know the experience of, hey, honey, I just learned this new thing. I want to show you. Can you help me? And it sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. Oh, she's man, she is so super supportive. I can't even, I can't even describe it. Oh, that's great. So she doesn't care. I mean, she doesn't even mind. Like, obviously, that's something 
it's obviously a nonviolent thing. Here, just shove on my arm and, and keep me, push me out of my stance. Try, and I got to try to keep it. That's obviously, she doesn't have to, it's not like she's trying to hit me or anything. But even then, sometimes if I'm like, okay, you know what? I need to practice my reflexes. Honey, just swing at me any way that comes natural to you. And she'll do that too. So I, I'm really lucky in that respect. I mean, I signed up to go do this thing in D.C. It's called the Wing Chun Lab. It's like a day, full day of just sparring. It's not a tournament, so there's no winner or loser or anything. But uh, it's just going to pressure test your skills. And um, and she's she's I mean, she's going to go with me, even though I found out, you know, people who haven't bought a ticket, they can't enter the facility as an observer. So she's got to go. It's down in D.C. She's got to go past the time in D.C. <laughs> but but she's willing to go with me to, to support me, you know, and and um, so I can't tell you how lucky I am in that that respect. Nice. Nice. I want to I want to rewind the tape. OK, you, 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 you told us something that I think is pretty important about you in that when when you do something, you're all in, you know, yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. And so I want to I want to know a little bit more about what your expectations or motivations were to get into martial arts. Was it something you knew you were going to be all in on? You, you talked about these different archetypes of people, but I don't know that we really, really got who you are out of that. Oh, well, mine was um, obviously, like I said, in one of my one of the things I wanted to talk about was the issue of self-esteem versus self-confidence. and. Mm. But, you know, when I was a kid and well, even today, if you see martial art flyers where they're like, why should you do martial arts style X? Because it gives you discipline, and build self-confidence and so on and so forth. Yeah, I wanted uh, better self-confidence because I was the shy, quiet type who got picked on a lot in school and, you know, verbally. But, you know, when people were sitting there saying whatever the hell they say. Oh, your four eyes or whatever. And that's tame compared to things they really said, you know. <laughs> but I always had like a, a, in my mind, I always had a, a, a snarky comeback. But I never said it because I stopped myself because I'm like, if I, if I say something back and the people that are listening in start laughing at, like if I make a fool of the, the bully, he might, in his embarrassment, decide, okay, it's time to get physical. You know what I mean? He might mm. not try to knock my block off because I made him look like a fool. And I didn't know that I could handle myself if um, if they did that. Mm. So I wanted to get into martial arts for, for self-defense and, and to free up my inner... Uh, I don't know what kind of, if this is a family friendly show, hopefully I can get away with saying this. Free up my inner wise ass. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's fine. Yeah. You know, because I always, I mean, like I can think, I think really quick, I think really quick on my feet and I have real like that. And I just have really good ability to have a really good snappy comeback. And, but like I said, I didn't want to do it because I worried it would get physical. <laughs> yeah. And um, so that 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 is how I started out, uh, wanting just the the t um, the physical skill. And clearly, you found something that worked for you. you. If you if you if you kept doing it, and you're still doing it. There there was something about it that worked for you. Right. Well, I mean, it's um, I mean, like I said, like I started with judo, and I, I was there only about six months because I mean. Uh, they focused a lot on tournaments and not a lot about, you know, how someone would come at you on the street. You basically started there. There are two things they do in judo for sparring. You either start right away on the ground doing mat work, or you do the thing where you're standing up and you walk toward each other and you, you like grab onto each other's knees and you move around and you try to feel for the right moment to throw someone, you know, but, not a lot of real fights <laughs> start out that way. So I wanted something that was more uh, from that position, which obviously would be a, a striking art, you know? 
And I went to this one school that said, I saw the advertisement and it's like, come here and learn uh, Tiger Claw, Tiger Kung Fu, Eagle. Uh, 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 I can't remember all the others that it claimed. And it also taught weapons and a whole bunch of different forms of Tai Chi as well. Sun style, Bagua, all that. But they, 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 they didn't really teach. Also, they didn't really teach a really realistic. <laughs> it was more like the acrobatic, like wushu type of stuff. Sure. And then I was just like, oh man. But I, I mean, the, to be honest, the thing that got me started, of course, was interested in finding a, a martial art in general. Was was uh, of course like many people's entry into martial arts was Bruce Lee. Um, I can remember the exact um, thing that started it all was. Long time ago, they were offering a package deal where you could get HBO and Cinemax combined for <laughs> for a discount instead. If you just rented one or the other, it was you know individually they cost more, but together they cost less. You know that kind of whole yeah. uh, two for one type of a deal. And the very first night we had it, they played Fists of Fury, all aka Big Boss, Fists of Fury, aka Chinese Connection. And then Return of the Dragon, also known as Way of the Dragon. They played all of them, one after the other, that first night we had it. And, you and then they, Yeah, and then they also played a um, Best of Martial Arts uh, compilation type of thing ho hosted by <clears throat> John Saxon, who was in Enter the Dragon with Bruce. He was uh, yeah. Mr. Mr. Roper, uh, not uh, Jack Tripper's landlord. <laughs> But, uh, There's a name that, that you know, on, only the, the real diehard old school martial arts movie fans are going to remember his name. Yeah. But yeah. They'd recognize uh, him. Yeah. And he was also uh, Nancy's dad in the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, that I didn't know. And he reappeared in Nightmare on Elm Street 3 and uh, Dream Warriors, which was like probably the coolest. Uh, my, my, my opinion, probably the coolest sequel of any movie ever. So it's got a rival in Aliens and Godfather 2. Dream Warriors is awesome. You're, but, you're, uh, you're a movie buff. Oh, yeah. And that's another thing Like we were talking about going out in left field before we started the interview and stuff. I, I can go out on tangents like a mile, <laughs> a mile wide. The from hallmark <laughs> of the show. Don't worry about it. Yeah. But uh, so the reason I bring up the compilation part is because John Saxon was narrating history of Kung Fu movies. And he talked about when Bruce Lee came around and he said, as a young man, Bruce Lee became a devotee of Wing Chun. And it showed a very small clip from this movie called Warriors 2, which was not a sequel. There was no Warriors 1. It, it was, from what I understand, it was like a bad grammar thing. It was like, instead of two warriors, oh, it, it okay. was Warriors 2. Like, yeah. like, you know, you show up with your buddy. We are Warriors 2. It doesn't mean also. It means <laughs> it means bad grammar is what it means. <laughs> so, uh, so it showed a clip of the guy doing the wooden dummy and uh, part of the BUG form and just looked really cool. And I wanted to take it. I wanted to learn Wing Chun right away, but I don't know. I just for some reason I just settled on. First thing I found, which was judo, and uh, then when I got, when I didn't really want to do that anymore, I started to look around. I looked around for um, Wing Chun, and there actually was a school back then, and I, I had my mom take me out that night to try to find it. We couldn't find it, mm -hmm. but we stumbled across, um, because listeners got to remember, this is back in the day of GPS on your phone. Yeah. I think it might have been. 93 94 it might have been before gps period you know very few people had gps's back then that's for sure yeah and they were more expensive back then now you yeah. you know you got to buy a hundred dollar gps now you get a free app on your phone <laughs> right you know but um so we didn't find it because there was no gps <laughs> and uh uh so we st but but we stumbled across the other school there and so i just like okay well 
I want to do Kung Fu. I'll, I'll take this for now. And then later on, I actually was able to locate, locate the Wing Chun School and got hooked and started it. I remember going in, it was around Christmas time of 94. I was a senior, uh, senior, yeah, freshman <laughs> at, at a university at Albany. And I basically, he, he ran the school. His name is Russell Seachon. He teaches in Albany. And he ran the school in a way, like unlike any other martial arts school I saw, where they let you come in and take a free trial class. He was like, no, you, you can watch tonight and, and see if you like it and, and come back and join. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, his house, his rules, you know, so yeah. I watched. And and it was everything that I thought it would be from those few clips I had seen, you know, and it, it's real economical and up close. Like if someone gets in your face, which is what bullies do, because most bullies were taller than me, so they would get up in my face. So I knew it would work for that reason, you know, and came back the next week. Well, it was around Christmas time, so I came back after New Year's. So in January of 95, at some point, I, I started Wing Chun. Mm. And I, I think I heard this in, in tone, not in word, but it sounded like that was kind of transitional for you, that there was this, that you had finally found where you felt you needed to be, martial arts-wise. Yeah, and I... I I got confirmation of that uh, when I came back and I actually joined the class. And I had, I can't remember, I don't think this happened on my first night. But if it didn't happen on my first night, it happened within my first month of being there. Um, one of um, Sifu Sichan's uh, 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 senior students was, um, he was just throwing, like, just, I mean, in slow motion, because I was a newbie still, but he was throwing attacks at me to just test out, like, if I could see how to respond with uh, the various, the, the blocks I had already seen and started learning. And uh, Sifu came around and was watching, and he said to his, he, he said to the senior student, he's like, wow, he picks up fast. And, and the, the senior, his name was Justin, by the way. He was, Justin's like, yeah, yeah, he's really getting good at it really fast. And I was like, you know, it's just like, uh, yeah, this is the style I belong with, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because it makes me think back of my days in judo where, you know, talk about it. This is a compare and contrast. Uh, <laughs> when they were teaching us how to do the arm bar, you know, I could get someone in an arm bar where, they couldn't move. They felt like they couldn't move. But when other people did the arm bar to me, that that hurt the way they did it, you know, because they 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 did this thing where they took their forearm and kind of moved it in like a sawing motion across your elbow yeah. as they got you yeah. into the arm bar. And it hit right on some nerve. And I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas with me, I'm like, okay, okay, I'm I'm gonna get that nerve today. And I'd put them in and I'd saw the arm across the elbow. I'm like, there, is it there? And they're like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, here? No. And I, I just never was able to do it in the way where they did. And it just, I'm like, maybe this just isn't a fit for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, it seems like everyone else who I let do the arm bar to me gets that nerve. I can't get it on anybody. So I, I then, Again, fast forward to Wing Chun, and I'm picking up inside of a. I'm being told I'm I'm getting really good at it inside of a month, you know. So, and like, there's a real um, something to be said for playing to your strength, you know. For sure. Like I don't know if you ever heard of this book. It's called Strength. Well, the last version I heard of it was called Strength Finder 2.0. No, no, I'm unfamiliar. And, yeah, it it's it talks about how. Everybody loves the underdog story. Mm. Uh, like he, he cites the movie Rudy based on, of course, the true story where uh, 
this really short guy is determined to be in the football team and and uh he he keeps going at it despite everyone saying no no it's not going to work it's not going to work and i haven't seen the movie myself but what i remember him describing was something about how like with, by the time he was a senior he finally got put called in and put in the game for like literally like one play so he spent four years to be in a in a game for like five minutes and <laughs> and you know it's like but they made a movie about him and everything. whereas now if he was a short guy who had decided to be a a jockey in the horse races no one would have batted an eye because well everyone who's short is a, you know what i mean like yeah he, he went with something that was like the easy win basically for lack of a better term but and he was saying, the author of the book was saying how we tend to really praise people who fight against all the odds instead of praising on people who have a, a hell of a lot of more success and faster and more consistent success because they played to their strength. Because we look at that as, oh, oh, he, they took the easy way out, <laughs> you know. But when I read this book, it was like a super light bulb moment. Me, I was like, yeah, yeah. Why, why fight and struggle and all of that? I mean, there's an easy answer there. Play to your strength. And um, with uh, Wing Chun, I, I was I played to my strengths, which is a, a very uh, laid back type of person. Usually, it usually takes a lot to get me to wind me up and get me mad or whatever. But, uh. Sure. Relaxation is is key in 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 Wing Chun and sensitivity and stuff like that. So I uh, I just think it's a good fit for the kind of person I am. It sounds like yeah. that. when I take a look at some of the things that you wanted to talk about, there's a common thread here, and a lot of it, I mean, really almost none of it, is about the physical. Now, certainly, you know, in, in in what you present on your YouTube channel, we'll, we'll get there a little bit later. But yeah. if we take that out of this list that I have in front of me, it's it's a it's a very thoughtful list about things that require thinking. And longtime <laughs> listeners know that you know that's that's my favorite thing about martial arts is thinking about martial arts and the 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 mental side, not just the the personal growth and development side that comes from training, but the contemplation of, you know, if I think about what I'm doing, how does that change what I do? Mm -hmm. When did you start becoming, <sighs> because not everyone looks at martial arts, <laughs> not everyone sp spends time, you know, figuratively sitting on a rock, thinking mm -hmm. about martial arts and how to train and what might be better and how do I do this better, et cetera. But it sounds like you do. Yeah. Were you were you like that day one? Did that come as you became more comfortable in Wing Chun? Where where did that part of your personality and martial arts dovetail? Uh, well, I, I I think it really came out. It, it didn't come out uh, in the beginning. I, I think it took. I think it was probably. I'll say as late as 2016 uh, because of my situation. Uh, you have to understand when I went to Russell Seachon's school, I mean, he, for a long time, he had class Monday through Thursday. And then once you got to a certain level, which I had, uh, he had given me permission to, I, I was able to go on Saturday mornings as well. Mm. So it, um, it was easy to train because, well, I always had people to go train with in a class. Six days, theoretically six days of the week. I didn't always make it to every class, but, you know, uh, I made it at least half of that all the time. And then and then my situation changed. I, uh, you know, I became a, I got four kids now. So <laughs> the tuition is a little bit, was a little bit hard to come by. Mm. And, uh. But then I, and also then I moved so that I wasn't as close to his school anymore. Uh, however, 
there was uh, another gentleman I'd heard of, namely Sifu Larry London, who taught in who taught in uh, another place called Broad Alvin, New York, which is even from where I lived at the time, it was still 45 minutes. Now it's like an hour, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> and uh, but he taught for free. Out of it, uh, he was a member of the American Legion, and they let him teach out of the their basement event room. And so I was like, oh, well, I may be paying in gas, but the gas is not as much as the uh, tuition at the other school. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people, especially in Wing Chun, a lot of people frown on that kind of stuff, like, you know, that um, lineage hopping type of stuff. But, you know, if I gave a damn what people thought, I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> so right. I, thought, I think that's uh, an important thing for all of us to remember. We, we yeah. you know, especially it's just, the current it's, environment. It's like, someone, uh, it's like somebody told me one time, they're like, I was telling them about this big deal people make about going from one lineage to another. And the guy, I can't remember his name. I remember he was a Chinese guy. And the reason why that's important is because of what he said. He's like, ah, all these 21st century white boys clinging to rules that not even the Chinese people cling to. <laughs> <laughs> even not even back in the day. It was like, you know, uh, I mean, there are a variety of reasons you might have to do that. Like I said, the money might be too tight. Uh, the distance might be too great. Uh, you know, maybe you get a job, a new job, where the hours you work don't allow you to go to the first school, but you do. Ha there are times you can make it to this new one. It, you know, I, I just don't see why starting at one place means you got to stay there till the end, hell or high water. You know, it's just so silly. But at any rate, my I point agree. being. Yeah, I mean, if you go to a different Taekwondo school, people don't bat an eye. For some reason, it's... Well, so, some people do. Yeah, well, I... I well, so, I should some people like, do. It's, really? You know, yeah. yeah I, I, and my speculation is that when, when people talk about karate, mm -hmm. is not, not only... I mean, yeah, there, there's, there's discussion and controversy about the various, let's call it branches or arms of karate, you know, Okinawan versus mainland Japanese and the founders and all those things. But there is general acceptance that at one point karate and, and the various styles of karate were pretty close to each other. Mm -hmm. The same thing can be said about Taekwondo. Yeah. See, I, I guess oh. cause, like, I don't hear about like, you know, like for example, you got Ishin Ryu karate and then you got Shotokan. Karate. So I've known that there were branches that way, but I've never heard that. It's always just boom, Taekwondo. That's all. Like you never hear. I mean, it's like around here where I live. There's Pace Taekwondo, which is that's because that's the teacher's last name. Sure. There's Br there's Brunswick Lee's Taekwondo because the school's located in Brunswick. The head teacher's last name is Lee, but but no differentiation in terms of like I said, like Okinawan versus uh, Kyokushin and stuff like that. Well, it but, seems like in in Kung Fu styles that there is a great deal of importance placed on lineage, and even more so than in yeah. other uh, trees yeah. of martial arts, at, to the point where being dramatically different and from a different region and, and mm -hmm. founded by a different person is not only identified, but celebrated. Yeah. Our Kung Fu is not even I close, has nothing to do with that Kung Fu over there. Yeah, yeah. That's that seems to be the tone for some people right. talking about the Chinese martial arts right. world. It sounds like that's what you're you're referencing. Oh uh, yeah, it's like some people say like if someone's from the Wong Wong Shan Lung lineage and they see like if you post a video like, Hey, I, I practice the If Ching lineage and here's my Bong So, how do you guys think? And you'll get people flaming you like that's so stupid. How how are you why are you learning to do Bong So that way? You're gonna get yourself hurt and it's like no. Oh, it shut up. Well, well, that part, that part seems to be universal. It, yeah. it is impossible. I, I saw, and and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna name names, but a a friend, somebody who's been on the show, and, and some people may have seen me make this comment, but posted a video of a form, and said, you know, this is, this is the right way to do the form as I understand it, and mm -hmm. 
most people were, were, were commenting, thank you, I appreciate this, you, you did a really good job breaking that down. One person said, hey, you in this one spot, you kind of did this thing, and I don't think that's right. And, and he said, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. I thank you for, for offering that feedback. You know, very, a very open and welcoming yeah. person. And then this one person wrote this paragraph of just, you're wrong, this is so wrong, how could you be so wrong, it's really wrong, yeah, yeah, yeah. how can you be so wrong, you're really wrong. And right. my comment was, can you be at least mildly constructive? And then right, it became, right. you're wrong here, and that part was wrong, yeah. and this is wrong. And we we have these armchair martial artists who right. are so hellbent on pointing out where people are wrong that, right. you know, they're wasting all this time they could be training. Well, and, and that reminds me of something uh, I saw in a group uh, regarding criti critical comments, but I'll, I'll come back. You had asked about when the thinking part really, really came into. Yeah, it's because, uh, you know, I never learned like when I was at Chun's, I had learned the three empty hand forms and the wooden dummy form. And Wing Chun has only six forms. There's the pole and the knives as well. I never got far enough to learn those, and I'm like, dang it, I want to, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, but the thing was, I. Uh, I had done, uh, uh, like, there was a lot of in and out of, um, I, uh, to be 100% honest, I probably spent as much time out of Wing Chun as I did in it, in the classroom, I mean. I mean, I always did my forms at home and tried to train my techniques and my stance and my footwork and kicks and whatever I could, you know. The part missing, of course, was the in-person doing something with a non-compliant partner type of stuff. But I mean, it's always been with me, even if I wasn't in class. But when I got started training with FIFA London, I was like, you know, man, I really, this is it. I, I, I'm 40, so, I, I was 40 years old. And I'm like, man, I should be better than I am, dang it. And I want to do something. But now he's got class only once a week. So I started asking him, what could I do at home? What What should I focus on on my own? <clears throat> and then he gave me some things activities and then i um i started browsing you know in internet forums and or, you know like the discussion forums then i started browsing the internet just you know good old google search youtube videos uh i i just was like just started to devour i was fanatical about trying to find things I could do on my own so I could get better since he had only the one class a week, you know, and came up with a, a pretty decent list. And I, I actually went from having no idea what I should practice other than my forms, punches and kicks to having a surplus of activity ideas. <laughs> and, you know, and then it became a matter of like, well, oh my God, this list is so overwhelming. If I don't, make some kind of schedule i'll never i won't get better because i'll be too scattershot you know and so i narrowed down i'm like okay well let's say if i wanted to pick i don't know let's say for example like five activities out of a list of say 20 i'll do those for a while till i feel like oh you know i've made some decent advances in this stuff but now it's time to change it up then i'll pick a different five and then swap them out because my whole thing is maximizing I, i'm i'm a real strong advocate for maximizing time you know because yeah. i mean there's only so many hours in a day and uh i live like with my life there's no way there's no way i can afford to set aside like if i say i want to train an hour every day it's not in a row you know what I mean? I, I get five I understand. minutes here. I really do. Five minutes here, eight minutes there, 17 here. And it adds up to an hour. It does. But I don't think you have to do it straight to still get benefit from it, you know? So uh, I, I agree. And in fact, there's even some evidence that psychologically, if we consider the, the mental component and to, to a certain degree, the physical component, that there is benefit in breaking up that amount of training in in smaller chunks or you know there are things that you are harder to train in five minutes versus you know 30 40 two hours and, and vice versa but i, I want to go back you, you, because this is a, a great example of 
a question that I think newer listeners, especially those who are new to martial arts, they have that fanatical bent that you, that I, that so many others do, and they feel overwhelmed by the sheer amount of what they could train. You know, over the last 18 months or so, we have all gained so many options for home training, whether that is is supplemental to our class trainer or, or whatever. But you talked about having a long list and picking a few things out of that list. Can you talk about how you prioritize those few things that you would work on out of the larger list? Um. Well, uh, basically, uh, like for example, Wing Chun is mostly upper body attack. So I would say, okay, well, you've got punch, elbow strikes, uh, uh, chop, hammer fist, back fist, palm strikes, you know. And, and of course, well, the backbone of Wing Chun is the straight punch. And so I would be like, okay, well, that's what I should focus on, that, that straight punch. And not just straight punch, like standing there in my, my basic stance, which our horse stance is called E.G. Kim Young Ma. So, but aside from practicing in just that, like let's say I would do, I don't know, 100 punches in my E.G. Kim Young Ma. Then I'll do 100 punches where I shift my weight more so to my left leg and right leg. Then I'll do another hundred with a while stepping, you know, and um, break it up, give it some variety. So then it kind of tricks my mind into thinking I'm not doing the same thing, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, and then on another day, I might do the other uh, upper body techniques I talked about. Although, I'll be honest, the one I practice the least would be my elbow strikes because, I mean, to, to be in a position where you're doing elbow strikes, you'd have to be in super close. And you usually don't want to be that close. So I just, I'm like, well, and it's rare to be as well. So I'm like, yeah, I'll do the elbow strikes the least. Uh, and I always do... Again, since Wing Chun is mostly the punch and stuff like that, I always do twice as many punches as I do kicks. That just I just came to me out of the blue one day. I'm like, yeah, that seems to make sense, you know. Mm. <laughs> um, and then there's uh, I, I I struggle back and forth between. Um, sometimes I used to also break out and do the defensive moves separately as well. Like I practice. Hawk sow, which is a slapping block. Lop sow, which is grabbing hand. I would practice my lop sow on the wooden dummy. Um, and so sometimes I would break out the defensive techniques and do just them. But then I'm like, well, do I really have to? This is where my overthinking comes in. I'm like, do I really have to break the defensive techniques out to do separately? Or can I, am I theoret aren't I theoretically doing them when I practice? The simultaneous attack and defense moves. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I do. I go back and forth on it. But, you know, that's how that those were the four main things I used to well, there are five main things I used to do. My forms, punches, kicks, uh, defensive technique, and then the simultaneous attack and defense. Those I figured were the nuts and bolt basics of the of the system, you know. And so I would practice those. And then uh, I also was like, well, I should work on footwork. Okay, well, when you just say footwork, it's like that's such a practice your footwork. It's like, okay, but how? So I have, I'm, I'm the kind of person who if I can't have a repetition number, I have to have a time limit that I aim for. Because otherwise you could practice footwork all day. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. And then still not be done. You know, you're never done. You're never you know? done. Never <laughs> but, done. So I would set a limit for myself. And I'm like, for some reason I obsessed over getting, if I want to do something for a certain amount of, a, like a running time, I always go by like every, I go in increments of 15 minutes. So 
I'm like, okay, well, I want to do footwork 15 minutes. Jeez, I can't practice footwork 15 minutes straight. Well, I'll do five rounds of three minutes. Or you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, that's just how my my brain uh, works. I can't like I couldn't if I wanted to do 500 punches in a day. I couldn't do 500 in a row. I'd have to do 100, and then do. Like again, how you know how I said I do half as many kicks, so that's two fifty. I'll do a hundred punches, then I'll do fifty kicks, and then three minutes of footwork. Yeah, you, you see what I mean? Like I divide it up in increments of like in basically in five round blocks. Which going back to something I had mentioned in my bio type stuff, where I said uh, I I I I write as well. Yep. That that increment that five round split. <laughs> comes from uh, um, uh, Shakespeare used to write his plays in five acts. And and most acts are in three. I remember most acts. Most plays are written in three acts, but Shakespeare wrote in five. So that's where I got the division of five <laughs> rounds. And, and, and I think there's a lot of value there. You know, you know there's, there's a, a longstanding kind of attitude within martial arts that absolutely has some value that would suggest build the discipline of doing the 500 punches at once or the 250 kicks at once. And I could make an argument for that, but I can also make an argument. And I think that this resonates better for me personally and, and, and for you, and maybe for a number of listeners that suggests how good is that 499th punch going to be? Yeah. Well, you know, that, after and... you've done that hundred and 200, mm-hmm. you're focused maybe, but you're probably bored. And are you actually training to get better or are you just going through the motions? Yeah, and anybody who spent time teaching knows that, you know, keeping things exciting is critical to progress. And it sounds like right. the, the way you're splitting it up, the way I would often split it up, supports that engagement and well, can I think help you progress you should, in smaller blocks. Speaking of speaking to strength or speaking to a, a different way to say it would be speaking doing structuring things in a way that speaks to your your own personal uh, mentality or deme- uh not demeanor we'll just stick with mentality because i can't think of the other word i meant <laughs> uh your, maybe your character uh it's a matter of like if you're going to press the hard line and say no no you got to do 500 all at once but then by th- let's say by 300 at best you're you find your mind wandering. Your hands are doing the punches. You're making your body mechanically do the punches, but your mind is like, oh man, I still got to do 250 kicks or whatever. You know what I mean? Like yeah. your mind is somewhere else. And, or maybe you're just anxious. Like my, my Sifu London, when I showed him an example of the schedule I came up with for myself, he was like, why do you do Sidlam Tau five times a day? And it dawned on me. I'm like, yeah, why do it? Because, a lot of people believe in doing Silum Tao, the first form, really, really slow. I mean, there are there are some people who can do it for up to a half hour. And because uh, there's a real slow meditative part to it. And by obviously by trying to do it five times a day, I again obsessing over that five. <laughs> I, I just I couldn't as I'm going through it, I'm like, I can't do this part slow. I got four more times to do it. You know what I mean? And so I wasn't doing it the quote unquote right way. So I was like, well, what if instead of doing Silum Tau five times, I made it a point to do any number of the forms five times a day. So I might do Silum Tau just once and do it the slow and controlled way that you're supposed to. And then I would work, pick one, one form to really focus on. So let's say, okay, the second form, Chum Q, I'll do that one three times. And then I'll do my, my, say, the wooden dummy form or something. You know, so I got five. I didn't do one form five times, but I did five forms collectively. You know what I mean? So, um, again, that's just the way my my brain works. I, I need a, a structure to how I do things. I can't just randomly, you know what I mean? I can't just randomly stand in the middle of the room and say, okay, I'm going to start doing some martial arts stuff. You know, I need, yeah, I need that structure to it. I need an, I'm the kind, I need an, an end 
game in mind. I get it. Um, totally get it. Because, I mean, martial arts in and of itself, martial arts as a whole does not have an end game. You never, but it's not like you could say, oh, well, I'm good enough. And then you stop training. You know what I mean? Like, I do. So, so since that is an ever expanding infinite uh, ocean of possibility, I can't change that, but I, I can make it so my, my practice is, <laughs> has a finite uh, <laughs> um, goal, you know? I want to take a bit of a hard left here. We don't, okay. I don't typically do this. It's not really my style, but in in what you sent over, there's there's a subject here that I have never seen anyone mention before, and and I want to hear I want to hear about it from you because it's, it's intriguing. Okay, the difference between self confidence and self esteem, and how martial arts builds one but not the other. Yeah. Okay. Talk about that. Well, that's funny. I wanted to write an article on. Uh, I'm good. Um, I wouldn't say I'm good friends, but I'm becoming good friends with another guest you had on there, Melanie Gibson. Yeah, Melanie's great. Yeah, and and I've written some guest articles on her site, and I had said one where I'm. I want to suggest an article: self confidence. It, it it builds self confidence, not self esteem. She's like, oh, it's interesting, but you know my book is saying that that's exactly what it does. And I'm like, Oh, well, I don't want to conflict with your message. then, <laughs> You know, but I, 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 what I mean is like, for example, I told you how I, I, I wanted, I started wanting to learn martial arts to deal with uh, bullies in, in school. And if, if it happened to get physical, right. So after a while of learning, I got pretty confident that I could, I could have handled myself. If it went that way, uh, but I I still felt like crap about myself as as a person, you know, like 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 let's say the bully came up and he's like rah rah rah, and I'm like yeah, get lost, and he got lost, and I'd be like, well yeah, cool. If that had gotten physical, I could have handled it, and then eventually my thoughts about that would stop, and then I'm just sitting there looking out the window and I'm like, the thought floats across my brain. I'm a really crappy person. I'm a garbage human being. You know what? I just had this low self-esteem. Uh, the difference, it, the thing is not a lot of people explain the difference. A, a lot of people think the terms are interchangeable and, and they're not. Self-esteem is about how you feel about yourself as a person um not about how you feel like wow that 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 bully got in my face and swung at me and i knocked him out with one punch i'm a good puncher you know what i mean that's confidence in a right and in, in a that's a, a feeling good about an ability but that has nothing to do with how you feel about yourself you know what i mean because you can be like i'm a good puncher but I'm a crappy person. You see what I mean? It's and like, vice versa. Yeah. You can be a good person and a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or a poorly skilled martial artist or right, poorly skilled right. at anything or in theory, everything. But, but here's the thing about that. The person with good self-esteem who says they're a crappy puncher, you want to know how they react to that? Either say, eh, so what? Or they say, yeah, I'm a crappy puncher. Well, I don't want to be, so I'm not going to sit here and whine about it. I'm going to do what I have to do to get better. Mm -hmm. Whereas the person with bad self-esteem would be like, I'm a crappy puncher too. I'm a bad person and a crappy puncher. Oh, my life sucks. I'm useless. I'm worthless. I'm not going to get out of bed. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it, it's Martial arts can help you, uh, yeah, get better skills to handle uh, getting picked on or getting jumped or whatever but it's not going to change how you feel about yourself as a person you go to class and you get a rush because the teacher said great kick and, and it's like cool but then that rush you get from that compliment will fade you know and unless well i wouldn't say unless because here's the thing good self -esteem, if you have good self-esteem you don't need to get a rush from things like that I mean, you like hearing them, sure, but you don't need them. You don't need external 
validation. And, uh, I'm with you. And that was a problem of mine for a long time. Like, I remember, you know, like, for example, you like, say you're the kind of person, like, you feel like you're single and you feel like crap because you're single. And then like, you go, I must be a bad person. Damn, no one wants to be with me. Or romantic. And then you get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, whatever, you know, whatever. And you think, wow, yeah. Well, I must be cool or a good person. Uh, someone wants to be with me. And it's like, yeah, great. But then, so what does that mean if they dump you? Right. You know what I mean? So now, does that mean that you really are crappy? They just didn't see it. And then when they realized you were terrible, then they dumped you. I mean, what? You know what I mean? It's like, or does that mean, oh, now I'm a crap. I was a good person. Now I'm a crappy person again. So it, and that was my, problem like and i i never got i was never one of these people who like if a girlfriend broke up with me i said to myself uh, oh great she dumped me now no one will ever love me again you know i, ne I never got to that point <laughs> i have known other people who did but I, I never went there myself it was more about uh, uh you know feeling like like i was a bad person or a bad partner you know Especially when, like, when sometimes people dump you and they tell you why. It's like, just say it's not working out. You don't have to be mean about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And I don't think anyone is. Uh, well, uh, it's different. If you got somebody who's cheating on you nonstop or beating the hell out of you, yeah, they're just a bad. They're bad. They they're not a they're not a good person at all. <laughs> if they do that kind of stuff. But we, if you got someone who just says like. I think more often than not, it's not that one person's the bad partner and the other was whatever. It's more like if you hook up with the wrong person, then it's, you know what I mean? It's like, I do. this is not compatible. We, we, exactly. We've all got our baggage. We've all got our histories. Yeah. And, you know, you can, you can handle your stuff and, and, but it, there's still, it's still going to become part of your character, what you've experienced, your history. Right. makes you who you are right. and yeah we 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 have this psychological condition where we individually must remain the heroes in our own story and we will do incredible mental gymnastics to make sure yeah. we remain the hero no matter what actions we take we, right. we we've all seen people that we never would have imagined would have done terrible things do terrible things right. and, and they justify it and sometimes right. it's at our own expense and and, and it's well, really I'm just gonna, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, in keeping with another example of what someone would think if they have good self-esteem versus they don't. For example, when one girlfriend broke up with me, she's like, this isn't working out. You're just too intense, Steve. And I'm like, what? And, and then, I mean, other people have said that about two to the point where I was like, oh, well, this I've isn't just. That. I've heard that one before. Yeah, this isn't just her saying it. It's other people. And then when I had bad self-esteem, it would send me off in a tailspin. Like, what is it? What does that mean? Why, what do they mean? I'm too intense. How do I dial it down? I don't want to be too intense. Like someone who's like a scary, overbearing, creepy guy or something. <laughs> and, and then nowadays, because I, I've been through a lot of, I, uh, at the encouragement of uh, a previous, um, partner who was she was super huge into you know uh, mental health and and things of that nature she got me off my butt to finally go get a mental health evaluation and then you know found out certain things about myself and they're like here we're, we'll prescribe you this and and now just so you know meds alone won't do it you need to go get consistent counseling slash therapy so after going through that in years and years, I mean, my self-esteem has just increased exponentially in those last three or four years over any uh, advancements I had before that, you know? So mm. I, uh, no, matter, no matter what the rest of that relationship was like, which I'll just, you know, was not good, <laughs> I'll, uh, if nothing else, I cannot take that away from 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 her she without I, i'm sure i would have gotten around to it or someone else might have pushed me to do it sooner or later 
but just thank God. You know how they say that old cliche, everyone comes in your life for a reason. Well, that, that was her reason. Get me off my butt and get me where I'm at today. I mean, obviously, most of the work was done by me because, you know, there's nothing she could do to make my self-esteem raise. It would either go up or it wouldn't. Uh, you know, I had to do that work myself, but she's doing a really, she did encourage me to get out the door and, and, and do it. And here we are today. But, uh, you know, nowadays, if someone says to me, I'm breaking up, you're too intense. I just shrug it off. Okay. Because I, what they mean is I'm too intense for them. Right. That, but if you find someone you're not too intense for, then that, that means that their statement is not universal. Right. And it finally helped me really realize a lot of people have said to me things to try to make me feel better in the past. Like, um, if I'm like, oh, man, she called me too intense. And I'm really bummed out about it. And my friend would say, her opinion, has no, her statement has nothing to do with you. I'm like, how does it? Not, I don't. What? How does it have nothing to do with me when it was about me? I don't get it. <laughs> you know? And. And then I finally realized what they mean is like, for example, if you had dated that woman instead of me, and let's say, like you just said, you've had people call you intense as well, she would have said the same thing. You know what I mean? So that's what it, it's just that my type of personality. And if I'm not the only person in the world that is like this, then she'd say that about anyone. So it's it's all about her. What's too intense for exactly. her? So that's why. It, it has nothing to do with me. And I'm like, wow, I finally get it. You know, it was so cool to, fi- to have that finally click, you know. But again, if you have the better self-esteem, someone just says this isn't working out, you just say, okay. And, and you go on your way, you know. <laughs> and um, it's just, man, it's such a weight lifted to have that feeling. To just let these kinds of things just instead of really digging inside and hitting that, you know, hitting that emotional soft spot, uh, just let them bounce off. It's yeah, just there's, such a there's liberating. A, uh, a quote, maybe it, people would call it more of a cliche that I'm trying to find. I'm, I'm going to, I can't find it. So I'm, I'm just going to butcher it. And then I want to ask you about the work that you're doing on YouTube and your book and, and, and all that. Um, if, it's something about if if a fish is judged on its ability to fly, it'll never yeah. see its value. Something like that. Right, right. You yeah. Know, when, when we there, there are so many people in the world, and there are so many martial arts, and there are so many martial artists, and and you know, you talked about, and and to me, this is kind of coming full circle. You know, you you had a passion for martial arts, you were interested, and you didn't let that initial school knock that out of you. You didn't say, oh, martial arts isn't for me. And unfortunately, a lot of people say that when they don't find the right school the first try. Right, right. And you kept at it and you found the school that worked for you. You found what worked for you. And and I think you can apply the same lesson. Easier to say than do, for sure, uh, when it comes to personal relationships, whether they be platonic or romantic. And, you know, we, we, we all have value. We're all figuring our own stuff out. And we all have people out there that will click for us. And unfortunately, some of us, you know, live in the woods, I'm raising right. my hand and there aren't okay. as many people around. And it's a little bit harder to find people that we click with. And some of us have other things, you know, we, we, uh, one of the things I've learned as of age is that far fewer of us have great, healthy, broad friendship circles than television and movies and internet would suggest to us. Most oh, yeah. of us have a couple really good friends and a bunch of acquaintances. Yeah. And, and it, it's funny, like you said that about the platonic, platonic thing, too. <laughs> Even just trying, I remember just trying to make, when I was just talking to people in high school, and I was super huge in fanatical, just like I am about martial arts. Like I told you, when I get interested in something, I dive in without even checking the water first. I just dive in at first, and I get into it. I was the same way originally, like a long time ago, with um, with horror movies. And I just, I don't know, I just liked the stories and the plots. And I especially liked the way that they made, special effects artists made the unreal look real. 
you know i just thought that was cool and would talk about it with people and, and i like i said i would dig deep and find out like oh yeah you know that dude who did the, the gore effects for friday the 13th he did dawn of the dead and day of the dead and he you know what i mean like i would go fanatical about stuff like that and people wound up being like wow dude you're a little weird i'm like what yeah dude you're a little too into those horror movies you're, you're gonna be a, are you gonna be the next uh you're gonna be the next son of sam man and i'm like no i just like movies you know <laughs> and, and a long time ago it used to bother me when i would try to open up and be friendly with people so i'm like uh you know what i just won't bring up that i like horror movies i'll just pretend i like comedies better you know what i mean but nowadays i'm like with again fast forward to contrast with the better self-esteem version of steve i don't like whatever you're an idiot you know what i mean it's like i mean think about how many think about how many serial killers there were before horror movies became as graphic as they are what the what the heck did they watch you know what i mean you just yeah correlation and causation are not the same right so now i'm just i realize i'm like okay well that person's just kind of bizarre for thinking that but let's talk about youtube yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about YouTube because uh, a conversation on serial killers and martial arts is is not one we're going to have time yeah. to unpack. I think yeah. actually there's something really interesting there. Yeah, uh, but we, you know, maybe we'll we'll have to have you back for that one. Yeah. <laughs> now, you have you, you mentioned I think at the top of the show you've started your own Wing Chun lineage. You're putting that information out there on well, YouTube. You've got a book. It, I, I, I would say. A- no, I, I have not started my own lineage. No, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still a student. Wrong dots. I mean, everyone says theoretically they're still a student, but I, I re- literally am. Like I wouldn't, like when I said, "Call me." What do I want to be called by? Do I want to be called Steve? I want to be called Steve because you can't call me. I would never portray myself as you cannot call me. Don't call me Sifu because <laughs> no one has bestowed that. No one has said you've sure. learned the system enough where you can be called Sifu now. Okay. Uh, until until slash unless I get recognized as that, no, I'm going to be 100% honest. And, uh, I, I, you know? I, I understand and, and relate very strongly yeah. to that statement. Um, so for, forget that part of it, but you do yeah. have a YouTube <laughs> channel where you're sharing some information. Can you tell the listeners about that? Yeah. I, I mean, it started with me wanting, like I told you, I, uh, when, I, when I started training with Sifu London and, and he does only one class a week, um, I mean, he would train more, but with me, but it's really hard to make it to Broad Alban more than once a week, being an hour each way. So I had to settle for the next best thing, which is whatever I can do on my own versus whatever I can rope family, friends, and loved ones <laughs> into doing with me. And obviously, the family, friends, and loved ones don't know Wing Chun. So that leaves a big question of well, what the heck do I do in, far, in, in terms of Chi Sao? You know, because if you're practicing with people who don't know what the heck Chi Sao is, then they cannot do Chi Sao with you. At least I should say the right way. And uh, if anyone out there doesn't know what Chi Sao is, uh, I don't want to get into a long explanation of that. Look it up. C H I S A O. A lot of people know it as sticky hands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot but of people, uh, even outside Chinese martial arts, right. know it as sticky hands and not Chi Sao. Right. I'm just used to people saying, what the heck is that? So I just, I just say, look it up. Sure. But uh, no. So. Um, I, like I said, I spent a lot of time digging around and trying to find things I could do. I even found something I could do that solved the pesky chief out question. What if no one around me knows what it even is? Uh, through a courtesy of a, a video done by a guy named uh, Dom, Dominic Izzo. He's a Wing Chun guy. He's a, in Chicago. He used to be a cop. He's a very, um, <laughs> to say he's an outspoken guy. <laughs> you know, uh, but still, I mean, here's the other thing. I don't pay attention to any, anyone. They say, oh, that guy sucks. Like why? Well, he's got an ego problem. Okay. But can he do Wing Chun good? Oh, that's good enough for me. You know, I, I don't believe in shutting people out because they have bad attitudes. If they got, if they got skill, then I just watch what they're doing. And I'm like, oh, wow, he can do something I can't do. That's cool. I should work on that. You know what I mean? Like mm. I, if you discount people by their attitude or, because they're a crappy person. I mean, 
you would just miss out on a lot, <laughs> as sad as it is. But uh, so anyway, I, I spent a lot of time gathering up these tips on how to train at home, not just solo stuff, but uh, with people who might not know Wing Chun or might not be a martial artist of any kind. And I was like, you know what, I should. At first, the idea was I just assembled them into. And now I think about it, I can't remember which came first. The, the YouTube channel or the Lone Warrior book. Uh, they, they're kind of like around the same time. Mm. But my idea was, you know what? I just took a lot of time gathering these up. I wish, wouldn't it be cool if someone else had already done that? Well, maybe no one did it for me, but I can do it for others. So I, oh, excuse me, I just started to share uh, random tips, free tips and ideas for people who want to get better at Wing Chun but can't make it to class as much as they want. You know, maybe on the nights that you do make it, it's a classroom full of beginners, so you still don't get any chi out practice. You know what I mean? Mm. And and that was the initial thrust of the channel. And then I started thinking about, uh, you know, if you don't eat right, and if you don't, you don't fuel your body with, the proper well fuel your body with the proper fuel <laughs> uh and if you don't exercise i mean you're, you're going to be sluggish and out of shape and you're going to give up easier like you'll get winded easier and have less stamina and everything and blah 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 so i should have some tips on exercise and nutrition as well and, and so there was that and then my adventures with that where i started out with things like P90X and Insanity and Team Beachbody uh, type workouts. And then I moved, I really, things really took off when I found out about something called high intensity training, which is just sounds like a lazy person's workout come true. Once a week, 30 to 40 minutes tops. But that combined with proper nutrition, I was 241 pounds at the beginning of January 2020. I'm I, nowadays. I'm still trying to get down to my quote unquote ideal body weight, but now I fluctuate between 163 and 166. Mm. So, so nice. anyone, nice. what? Nice. I was thanks. I was, anyone who thinks once a week for 30 minutes can't work, I invite you to look at my before and after pictures, and you know, it 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 does the trick. So, um. So I started offering the exercise and, and nutrition tips slash also making videos about like my struggles and stuff, being realistic about that. Cause I think that's another thing. Like people look at a guy like say Tony Horton who did P90X mm -hmm. and see how ripped he is and stuff at 50 or whatever, however old he is now. Uh, and they think, wow, well to be like that, I'm 50 now, but I can't start now and get like that. You know what I mean? Like people think you had to have started like that when you were like young enough to walk to be that fit now. And it's not true. All the stuff about metabolism slowing down, don't eat after eight o'clock and all that. There's just so many silly myths out there. And I said about wanting to, to bust them. And well, here's the thing. People will either listen and take it into consideration or they'll say, no, my belief is the right one. And they'll stick with what they believe. And that's fine, too. I That's just wanted nice. to do, I just feel like doing my part, putting my word out there and my thoughts. And I, I think a lot of people get like getting all these flame wars and stuff. Like they take things too personal. Like you say, you say to them, it doesn't matter if you eat high protein, low carb, but you just have to watch your calories. And you're just saying your opinion, but people get all bent out of shape, almost like you directly said to them, Hey, Jeremy, this one's for you. You're an idiot. Because you believe it's high protein, low carb. You know what I mean? Like right. they take it like you said it to them directly, like a personal insult. And we live in this time when, you know, whether we're talking martial arts or diet or anything, people feel like they have to be put into these corners, these camps, and they have to yeah. defend it so vehemently. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, right. everything they've done up until now is irrelevant. If there, if there's a, it doesn't matter if there's, if if their way is is viable. 
if there's another way that's viable, then it could be better. And what they've done might not be the best. And heaven forbid that they've invested any time in the thing that might not be the best because right. their ego isn't sufficient. To right. handle that's, that. that's another example of someone who probably has low self-esteem. Because exactly. <laughs> exactly. if they had good, they wouldn't care. But right. then speaking of myth busting, then I also started to think about um, this was actually added at the original thing was it, it went okay wing chun tips oh and then exercise it was just a hop skip and jump to adding exercise and nutrition tips. but then the more i realized how much better my self-esteem had gotten the more i realized i'm like you know i'm busting these exercise and nutrition myths and i sh- i started one playlist on the youtube channel it's called fighting words where i share my because any, like I said, anytime you share your opinion, people think you're starting crap just because you shared your opinion. Like you're saying, I think of something this way, so that means everyone else is wrong. And and you're not. You're just sharing your opinion. But so I jokingly called it fighting words because I imagine the things in that playlist would cause the most flame war stuff. <laughs> mm. You know, oddly enough, those are the videos that have gotten the most people saying, I agree with you. <laughs> but it didn't work out that way. But I thought to myself, well, I'm saying this is a myth. Here's a myth, a nutrition myth. Here's a martial art myth. Here's this, here's that. And now my self-esteem is getting better. And I've done this through evals, medication, and, and counseling. I'm like, you know what? Why not also talk about mental health? And, and I said, I actually started talking about it on this website called Martial Talk. And I posted... It was, I said, mental health is the most neglected aspect, not only of martial art training, but of life in general. And I went on a big, huge, long rant about, about what I meant by that and why I felt that way. And I was explaining things I had been diagnosed with and actually got a lot of praise on there about my forth, being forthcoming and Good. candor and everything. And, and I started to do that on, on YouTube as well. I have mental health. Uh, I'm going to actually start a, an entire playlist that's devoted to self-esteem because I'm just so sick of like the misinformation out there. People thinking self-esteem, self-confidence, and even arrogance and narcissism are all interchangeable. And it's like, no, feeling good about yourself, saying I'm a good person, that's not arrogance. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I mean, unless you're out there, you know, strangling cats and kicking babies and you're saying i'm a good person then it's like no no dude you're not you need help <laughs> well it's if, not that if, if people it, want to it, find the youtube channel let's let's we, oh, we've yeah. talked about it. i want to make sure that they know how to find it where um, they go easiest thing to do is just type just go even if you go to just google or youtube itself you just type in geek wing chun and i'll be the first result geek <laughs> wing chun and and of course yep. you know in case somebody's new and they don't know that we do this. We have show notes at whistlekickmarshartsradio.com yeah. and we put all the links over right. there. But, um, right. and then I just, you also asked about the book and stuff. So I, the reason why the book exists is because I, I summarized what I feel for all my best tips into the book. And whereas the tips on the channel are, are free, uh, the book costs <laughs> because you're, you're uh, paying for the convenience of the fact that I summed up all my best tips. <laughs> into one spot so you don't have to dig around through hundreds of videos to find them. Um, yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, cool. Yeah. We're, we're going to link all this stuff and, and you've got, you know, a website and Facebook and Twitter yeah. and, and you're all over the place at that geek wing chun. That's you. It's nobody else. That's you. So fairly easy to find. Yep. Which is cool. And, you know, I, I just kicked things. I apologize. And, so yeah, I I think I thank you for being here and and this this is a good this is a good time for us to fade out. But I, okay. I want to ask you for one more thing as we do, and that is you know you've talked about a lot of good stuff. We we have we have covered a wider variety of topics on this episode than just about any any episode. <laughs> I I think is awesome. I, I absolutely love when we do this because that means we get something for everyone. But if yeah. you were to kind of not necessarily sum up but close up our conversation today with respect to the listeners, you know, I'm going to record an outro later, but this is your last chance to talk to them. So what, what would you say to them as we fade out here? Basically 
I would say, you know, at, at my channel, again, not to overly blow my own horn, but I think you get um, an, a view of Wing Chun at my channel that you might not get in other places. And I know for a fact, you definitely don't get stuff about mental health and self-esteem on other martial art channels. And I know because I look, because I'm like, you know, people always say, oh, when you're starting a YouTube channel, you got to find your niche. And then it's even better if you find a sub niche. And I hit a gold mine because <laughs> no one's talking about how mental health can affect. I mean, mental health can affect it. So you don't even want to get out of bed to go to work, which is something, you know, you have to earn money to live, you know. But if you don't want to even get out of bed to earn money, do you think you're going to want to get out of bed to do martial arts? which is a quote-unquote optional thing. Of course, you and I know for us it's not optional, but you, you know what I mean. It's like you don't have to survive. You don't have to do martial arts to survive. You do have to work so you can pay rent and utilities and buy food. And stuff. So you'll definitely get a unique take on, on all of that. And even the exercise stuff is unique because everyone's doing, uh, everyone's pushing, go to the gym six days a week for an hour at a time. And then this whole once a week, 30 minutes flies in the face of everything, but it works. And you just stick with me and, and see the transformation and hear me out. You'll, you'll understand, you know, like I said, you'll understand a different viewpoint and you'll either try it out or you'll stick with uh, what you do. And that's fine as well. You know, we've never tracked the, the number of topics that we've covered in a particular episode. But if we did, I suspect that this episode might be one of the ones where we talked about the most different stuff. And if you know me, longtime listeners, and you know I love that. I, I could I can go all over the map. And we did on this episode. And that's one of my favorite things about what we do. And I really want to thank Steve for his willingness to go in all these different directions for the duration of the show. It was awesome. Thank you so much. If you want to go deeper on this episode, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we've got the links for all the things that we talked about. Episode 622. You can go right direct to Steve's YouTube website, the rest of his social media, all that stuff that we, we chatted about today. Now, if you want to support us, if you think that the episodes that we put out are worth a little bit of money, consider supporting us on Patreon. Consider making a purchase at whistlekick.com. And if you want the free support version, if you want the version of helping us out that doesn't cost you a dime, well, ring up our friend, shoot somebody a message. Hey, have you guys checked out this show? You know what's going on with Whistlekick? They're doing some cool stuff. And if you've got feedback, if you have ways to help us make cooler stuff, we want to hear it. Best way, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at Whistlekick. And if you've got guest suggestions, topic suggestions, you can leave them at the website. You can email me, whatever works for you. Now that's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 